Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vollmer. Actually, I'm going to shift over this way since I'm not tall enough to see over the podium. Um, so um, I'm going to uh, just kind of run through a couple of the highlights of kind of, I think, where we are with um, treatment of necrotizing pancreatitis, minimally evasively, uh, in 2017. Um, so I'm going to briefly touch on the important reclassification of acute pancreatitis um, that I think it's important for anyone who's treating this disease to know about. Um, talk a little bit about sterile necrosis, uh, the timing of intervention, and then the uh, different interventions themselves. So um, I think that probably most people in the room know about the new uh, Atlantic reclassification process, uh, process, but I think that if you don't, this is really important. Um, we all know about the Atlanta classification uh, led by Dr. Ed Bradley in, in 1993, and now um, almost 20 years later, or 30 years later, we, are, um, we, have a re, we, we now have a, a new classification. Um, this is, we, uh, I think, the, the, the worldwide community that, um, that really does, uh, publishes and uh, looks at, um, at literature in this area is we're really trying to hold to uh, using a com this common language. So I'd like to kind of run through the... Um, run through this with you. So for patients that are, have acute pancreatitis, they really kind of uh, separate out into two arms, uh, those with interstitial edematous pancreatitis, which can then go on to develop in the early phase of the first one to four weeks, acute pancreatic fluid collections. Um, and then if they persist, if these fluid collections persist longer than this to a pseudocyst, um, please note that with this new classification, that we really are only seeing pseudocysts about 10, in a ten about 10 percent of patients that develop severe acute pancreatitis. Um, this is, and then patients that develop necrotizing pancreatitis, first um, four weeks um, in the early phase are termed acute necrotic collections, whereas after, um, in the, after four weeks, called walled-off necrosis. And I think that um, one of the things, again, that we're finding is that the majority of patients that actually develop severe acute pancreatitis, most of them actually do have some component of necrosis, and they're really kind of in this walled-off necrosis um, category. Um, this is an example. I think um, we, most of us, um, have trained in the area where everyone calls everything a pseudocyst. Um, um, and we, you can see in this slide that um, that you know, there's there's the uh, the patient this is the same patient at 30 days with a CAT scan, and we do an MRI. You can see that this patient that would uh, that some people might call a pseudocyst is actually a patient with Waldorf necrosis. So, um, moving on, um, what about sterile necrosis? Um, I think uh, sterile necrosis is still an area um, where there is. Uh, maybe not as much controversy, but still, I think um, it, there's not a, 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 as much of a clear, um, clear standardized care pathways for patients with sterile necrosis. Um, but I think that, you know, in terms of a blanket statement, I think we can say that um, drainage of sterile collections in general, um, I think we should um, not not be doing, except for. Um, for uh, in, in just in some in some instances, and again, I'm, I'm not going to really talk about those those situations today. But one of the things that you have to think about in patients with sterile necrosis is if you intervene, you can basically risk iatrogenic infection, and that pretty much con completely changes the course of the disease. Um, the other thing I think that's really uh, important to note is that uh, many patients with sterile necrosis can be treated conservatively with supportive care. And looking at a um, um, a, 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 a paper by um, by Hayama Van Sandford from the Dutch Pancreatitis Study Group, um, of 639 patients with necrotizing pancreatitis, 62% of them can actually be treated without intervention. And here is um, one example of a, a patient at 30 days and at six months, and this is without without drains, without anything. So um, so we know that patience is is really a virtue. Moving on, um, I'd like to talk, talk, touch a little bit on the evolution of timing for intervention. This has really changed um, very much over the last, um, the, the last you know, 30 to 40 years. 
the timing of surgery for uh, for severe acute pancreatitis um, in the in the uh, the latter part of of the last century. People, we were doing early necrosectomy or even total pancreatectomies in the first few days. Um, we've moved in the mid-90s. There was kind of a movement to delay surgery, and that actually continued. And, and now we're really delaying surgery for infected necrosis to um, at least four weeks or, or later. And this really enables the, um, the inflammation and the, uh, the, the SERS response to subside and the tissue to demarcate and the wall to encapsulate, and it makes any kind of intervention we do become much, uh, much safer. Looking at a, a, a paper by Mark Besselink, um, we can see mortality on the y-axis and the the uh, the timing of the intervention on the x axis, and you can see that as we delay the intervention, the mortality um, the mortality improves. So there are certainly other reasons for improvement in mortality, better ICU care, and things like that. But 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 the delay is is absolutely a component of this success. Um, and I, just as I think a picture is worth a thousand words, and um, looking at um, you know the, what happens from the inflammatory process in a patient where you just kind of sit back and are patient and wait for this um, for this uh, the wall to encapsulate and the, the the inflammatory response to subside, you can see this patient at T minus one one day the onset of their pancreatitis that we were able able to capture at four days. 30, 30 days and 48 days. And you can see how, um, you can actually see this process um, occurring in real time. And it's, um, I think that, um, so as far as early phase um, invasive intervention, in the first couple of weeks, certainly there are isolated um, patients where where we do need to intervene, uh, maybe abdominal compartment syndrome, bowel ischemia. But in general, I think um, in general there's really no role for invasive interven intervention. Um, I think it's really best um, unless uh, and there are specific indications. But really, uh, try and avoid ERCPs. Try and avoid pancreatic duct stents. These are almost assuredly going to inf iatrogenic infect your patients. Um, avoid percutaneous drains and transgastric procedures and surgery in, the, in these first couple of weeks. Um, but um, and but you know after the uh, at three to four weeks, um, really the the primary um, indication for intervention is is infected wall duct necrosis. So um, finally, um, let's move on and talk a little bit about some of the optimal intervention strategies for infected wall duct necrosis. I think that um, one of the, the you know, there's been a, so much um, so much progress that we've made in the last decade or so, um, looking at approaches to this disease. And I think, and there's certainly there's excellent data now for some for the step up approach. Um, and the way I like to think of a step up approach is three Ds: delay, drain, and debride. Um, we've just talked a little bit about the the first D or uh, or the delay aspect. Um, and so the next thing. Uh, so we'll talk. I'm going to talk a little bit next about uh, drain, drainage, and debridement. Um, there are um, uh, there are uh, many t topics within each of these, and I'm just going to talk about percutaneous catheter drainage and two of the um, kind of possible debridement techniques. So let's look at some of the um, just briefly kind of touch on the uh, some of the, the data um, that we have now on percutaneous catheter drainage. We really have great evidence, very strong um, level one and level two evidence now to support uh, to support the success of percutaneous drainage. And when I say successful percutaneous drainage, meaning that that's all that's necessary. We don't need to do any transgastric procedures or any other kind of interventions. Um, these uh, kind of a, a listing of, of, of I think the, the great um, evidence that we have to support this with about 30 to 50 percent success rates. Um, I think that um, one of the, um, the, the keys for success, uh, I think if you look through some of these, these uh, papers, um, using, the, uh, using upsizing your drains um, from the smaller French size to the larger French sizes, and I think a very key component, um, if you look at some of the older literature in Europe versus the United States, the U.S. results were far less than than the European results, and and I think one of the key at the key differences is that um, is that 
that the the Europeans actually flush their dra their these percutaneous drains with with much larger volumes, and they essentially lavage out these cavities. And um, and when we actually converted to this much higher uh, flush rate, and we our our our, our uh, success rates are now um, compa comparable to the um, to the European data. So um, I think a very easy thing that we can do to um, to uh, to, to change the outcome for our patients. So let's uh, talk a little bit about some MIS to debridement options. So the step up to the VARD, so we can step up from uh, drain to, um, to if, if that's not successful, to, to open surgery, to, uh, to, um, to a VARD procedure, to um, transgastric procedures. Um, I, uh, uh, the VARD procedure, I'm not going to actually talk uh, so much about the kind of the show and tell of the operation itself. Um, I put, it is, we have it on YouTube. Um, but basically it's done through a, a flank uh, um, incision um, in the, uh, the mid-axillary mid line. You follow the drain in and you can do a, a debridement under laparoscopic guidance. Here's a, a patient, uh, the preoperative CAT scan, a postoperative CAT scan, and our operative specimen. This was actually a 20-minute procedure, and this patient spontaneously diuresed 12 liters of his anasarca um, in three days, uh, three days post-op. So it's really, really wonderful um, when it works. Um, as far as, uh, as as far as evidence to support the kind of the step up to the VARD, uh, the uh, came from the Dutch. They did a randomized controlled trial of open necrosectomy um, versus step up to uh, the step up approach to the VARD, and really had some. Um, showed that the, for infected wild duct necrosis, we, the composite endpoints of death and major complications were a uh, significant improvement. Um, the long-term complications such as diabetes uh, and, um, and even exocrine sufficiency also a significant, statistically significant improvement and also a significant uh, health care reduction. Um, some of the advantage of, of a VARD procedure over some of the other minimally invasive uh, retroperitoneal uh, um, uh, procedures that are out there, very effective. Only about 80% of patients uh, just need one procedure. Very simple to perform. It's very low tech, very simple, straightforward instruments available in almost any operating room. You don't need fluoro, you don't need special, you know, amplets, dilators, and um, things like that. And very low cost, and it really can be done anywhere, including in resource, resource poor settings. So um, as far as um, I think another an area that's really taking off uh, and has been for the last um, last decade around the world is is basically step up to endoscopic transgastric debridement. Initially, there were many different there was uh, many different kind of ways to do this with um, double pigtail stents um, and um, and um, kind of different options. I think that. Um, a lot of these other peripheral uh, methods of, of accessing the cavities is really, they're really being taken over by the introduction of the 15 millimeter axio stents. Um, I think this is completely, this is re really revolutionizing um, uh, uh, transgastric debridement because these stents, they're short, um, very low complication rate, they're quick to, uh, to, uh, to place and, um, and really enable uh, truly effective debridement. We have great consensus guidelines for now for severe acute pancreatitis. One is um, the IAP and APA um, guidelines that were published in Pancreatology in 2013. I'd like to direct your attention to that. And then we are in the process right now of an effort led by the ASGE with representation from, uh, from SAGES to develop consensus guidelines for endoscopic management of Waldorf necrosis. And um, we hope to have something um, kind of uh, Get, I guess uh, this kind of finalized this spring in DDW, and hopefully something will be in print um, within the next year. So, in summary, of uh, um, I think uh, number one, I think very important for us all, both in clinical and in research communications, to uh, to use the revised 2013 nomenclature. Um, Leaf sterile necrosis alone, I would say, for the most part. Uh, the three Ds of step up is really, I think, the new standard, and there's there's a lot of evidence to support this. So basically, delay to greater than four weeks when you can drain and then debride, and there are many many debridement options. Um, but I think that 
one of the one of the one of the things that's most important is that because the um, because the the treatment is so highly customized to to each patient, it's really best to to, to do this in, in in the context of a multidisciplinary team um, that you form at your your, your institution. Um, so um, thank you um, very much.